Well, I am uh, happy to be here and live, I guess live, but they're recording this for Seattle Science Foundation TV with uh, some of the best orthopedic uh, res, oh, there's Brenton, he's a neurosurgeon, but some of the most famous orthopedic uh, surgeons, spine surgeons in the country. Uh, it's a great honor, and I'm sorry I don't have an interesting case to present to you unless you would call my life an interesting case. Uh, so the good folks at SSFTV asked me to give a talk, and I thought I would give you a talk uh, that may be a little bit different to shake things up. So should I just start with this, uh, Rick? Okay, great. Yes. I'm going to share my screen with you guys and uh, talk a little bit about something that I think is quite interesting. I'm going to call it the win-loss matrix, uh, and I've given this talk before. I'll come back to that later. Um, you know, this is, I'm sure everybody's talking about this. This is me zooming in, uh, in late March, falling asleep, as you can see, and within 45 days, I've become an expert. You've probably done this at home, two zooms simultaneously, uh, trying to pay attention to both on two different computers. So we've come a long ways, and I have to thank the folks at uh, Swedish Hospital. Uh, Jens Chapman is on this call for I mean, for really providing a venue, I think that's grown significantly uh, to fill a void uh, that we can't have uh, filled any other way because we can't travel, right? So I've given up multiple trips to Korea and China and Europe in this time. So it's been very sad for me. So these are my disclosures, but let me provide for you some more relevant disclosures for today about my biases. The first is I uh, and we are spinal surgeons and I believe that what we do every day matters. That is in doing surgery and seeing patients. Uh, I believe that because in the right patient, spinal surgery is effective. And I think uh, Rick is proof of that with, uh, with one of his star patients that has probably generated more spine work for us than, than anything in recent memory. And uh, hopefully you guys know what I'm talking about. And the last part is that this is amazing and we need to keep doing good work and not be deflated by um, the opinions, if you will, uh, often wrongfully so that what we do maybe isn't as good as what it really could be. And, and that's not to say there aren't surgeons that do the wrong things or there aren't surgeons that make mistakes or things don't always go the way you plan, because of course that's the case. Now, I'm going to reprise you with the, my chair's address, which is the presidential lecture for the spine section. For the orthopedists, the spine section it handles all spine matters for the double ANS and CNS of which are two major parent organizations. Uh, I had my presidency finished in 2019 in my hometown of Miami. And this is the address I delivered as a president of that society because I wanted to connect with folks that really were my close friends and, and the 300 people in the room that are your best friends in spine and can understand what we're going through. And, I, and so I apologize if it's a little bit like a chair's address, but uh, I wanted to thank, of course, my family, my partners and, and organized neurosurgery. Uh, but I also wanted to talk about what that meant in terms of the spine section. If you haven't been in a meeting, it's, I think SRS and spine section easily rank uh, very high in, in terms of the regard. And I think ISAS as well, but made up of members, residents and fellows, senior retired medical students and uh, APPs, associate members. And of course there's an executive committee, Washington committee, payer response, education, uh, our, our foundations uh, and fellowship and research. So it's a really powerful and important organization that represents all of neurosurgery in America or North America that does spine. Things like dealing with T-lift codes. So I wanted to get this out there because this is important for all of you that practice and have to make a living, how we get paid uh, for the most part, relying upon things like demonstrating value to society. So that's, that's a lot of what the spine section does, but I'm a neurosurgeon. Right, so I understand that probably more than half of the people listening tonight or in the future are not gonna be neurosurgeons. They're gonna be orthopedic surgeons. And I thought I was gonna be doing brain surgery as a neurosurgeon. I pretty much don't do brain surgery and pretty much you know, haven't, except in rare instances for 20 years. And I do spine surgery and Larry Ku coined the term neuropod, which is I had to learn all things orthopedic and, and learn all the great things that Rick and Jack and Izzy and Scott and Jens uh, could, could teach me so I could become the complete spine surgeon because that was lacking somewhat in our training. So we call ourselves neuropod, like neurosurgeon and orthopod put together, right? So let me just say that this talk is geared towards neurosurgeons, but I think there will be great relevance to all spine surgeons. So the first question is, what's the meaning of this talk? What does the title mean? Win-loss matrix. And I think it's fundamental. It's taken me 20 years of my career to get to this point to talk about this issue. So Let's just talk about winning, right? Everybody knows what winning looks like. Here's something that you have at home. This is a nice card sent to me by a very powerful and wealthy patient who uh, thanked me for, for helping her run a marathon. And of course you look at something like this and you're like, wow, you know, that's 
you know, that's the kind of stuff you love to get, right? Because you're like, wow, I am really killing it, right? And uh, this is this is my wife on uh, Biscayne Bay with with uh, one of our dogs, and this dog looks like this dog's winning, right? This is what winning looks like, and everybody knows what that is. But what about losing? What does losing look like? So here's one of my patients who. The daughter texts me this picture. They were at some kind of a festival and said, this just happened to mom. What do you think's going on? Well, I think that most experienced spine surgeons already know where this is headed and that's losing, right? So here you did this huge surgery on someone and then this happens to them. You're in for another round and, and questions about was it enough? Did you not do enough? Did you do too much? All of those things. And of course, um, losing in your personal life as a spine surgeon. I love Becker's spine. Uh, you guys read or watch Becker's spine? I love it. It's like um, the Inquirer or the New York Post of spine surgery. So if you're feeling bad about yourself, sit on the toilet, read some Becker's spine. You know who got a divorce, who's bankrupt, who's getting sued, all that's out there, right? So that's what losing looks like, right? So the question really is, if you're a gambler, you play blackjack, play roulette, you know, play poker, are winning and losing really equivalent? And this is a very important area of study in it's uh, an area called behavioral economics. Now, uh, Danny Kahneman, who you may know, uh, has written many books, and he came up with this concept of behavioral economics and the concept of loss disutility. <clears throat> he won the Nobel Prize for his research on this in 2002, and here he is getting the Nobel Prize uh, at the Karolinska Institute. And the concept is that, in general, if I were to give you $2, that would be like taking $1 from you. In other words, if I give you a dollar and take a dollar, that's not the same emotional event. If I take a dollar from you, that's like, it's like getting $2 on the positive side. So there is a non-symmetrical relationship between winning and losing. And this is a fundamental basis of, I think, how we are constructed psychologically, at least as we are mature as surgeons. Now, there's a biological basis for this, by the way. If you look, for example, at the concept, if you, if you believe in evolution, us being descended from tree-dwelling uh, primates and whatnot, right? Here's, here's a, a, a primate that's been consumed by a boa constrictor, okay? And this is from, I believe, Indonesia, right? So, this is, so you wonder why people are afraid of snakes, right, and spiders. It's innate. Babies are afraid of snake-like objects. Monkeys, even baby monkeys, have never seen a snake, are afraid of a rope. And this is inbred into humans, right? And why, right? Well, it's actually, they've done, I'm, I'm a neurosurgeon, right? So the dorsolateral nucleus of the pulvinar fires as soon as a monkey sees a rope, like a coil, not a rope straight, but like looking like a snake, right? And so there is an inbred loss aversion that protects us because loss can often be permanent, meaning loss of life, loss of limb, loss of things that really matter, loss of your last meal. Now we're blessed to live in this, even in the age of coronavirus, in this amazing society in America where uh, Maslow's pyramid is fulfilled almost all the time, except for the top two levels. So there's a biological reason for this, but it also explains so many social phenomena. And I've struggled with this because, I mean, who does not know a number of their friends in our field who've gotten a divorce, right? So let's play this out a little bit. So two adults meet, they decide to share a life together. They fall in love, right? One does a very thoughtful and important thing for the other on a given day. Later, that same individual does something which is equally bad, negative, mean, or uncaring. So equivalent, equivalently bad to the good thing that that person did. Which act is remembered? Well, I think this is quite obvious. If you've been married or had a long-term relationship or you have children, which one is felt over time? Replicate this process, five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 50, 50 years more. What do you think the expected outcome is? So this explains in a very simple economic way how things play out in people's lives. Now, how, what does this have to do with surgery? Okay, because surgery is where the rubber meets the road. I tell my patients every day, going to surgery is like going to war. Right after we do, after we do surgery, after we operate, we own you. Every pain you ever feel will be blamed upon me. They say, "No, no, no, I love you, Doctor Wang." No, no, that's not true. You may still like me, but you will, in some ways, think about me, and hopefully, it'll be positive. But sometimes it's going to be negative. So, I came up with this concept of this win-loss ratio. In other words, if you want to keep going on in life, let's say you're going to be a surgeon, you want to keep operating. 
and you don't want to stop and you don't want to you don't want to lose uh, heart. And I was watching uh, again. I was watching um, Last Dance about Michael Jordan. Right, great documentary with Netflix. They just re-released it, and ESPN talking about how Michael Jordan, right, the, the best basketball player who ever lived, how he even got burned out. Right, this concept of win loss could be two to one. So you win twice and you lose once. So if you're playing poker, that's pretty good. Playing blackjack, pretty good. But not everybody can do that. Some people can't gamble, right? So maybe it's 100 to 1. Now, what does that mean for surgery? Well, we know what a win looks like. You take a person who's in a wheelchair, you do a surgery. After that, the patient can walk or is pain-free. And they send you cookies, and they love you, and they gave you five stars, and they tell all their friends about how great Dr. Lieberman is, that this, this doctor is a great doctor because he saved my life. He's a mensch, right? So that's a win, right? But how about the case where maybe you did a surgery and the person was a little, was a little bit or a lot worse, or maybe significantly uh, impacted like they lost their job or got a divorce or something like that. I'm not saying you would necessarily paralyze a patient, that's a rare event, but something really bad. What kind of ratio do you need to keep working? Keep working ethically, I should say, right? So in neurosurgery, we can discuss this very easily because the spectrum is so wide. So if you have a ratio of two to one, meaning you get two wins for every loss, you can be a vascular neurosurgeon. You can clip aneurysms and you can do these things that regularly result, you have a hand in the person's death or disability. That doesn't mean that you're not doing a, a net good. You're doing a net good, but you have to face this on a regular recurring basis every month, right? If you are a 100 to one or something like that, maybe you should go into pediatrics, right? Because pediatricians, let's be honest, they rarely really hurt people, right? You could miss a diagnosis. If you have any questions, just send them to a specialist, right? Really hard to hurt people, right? Now, spine is somewhere in the middle. And I would guess that my, I've been doing a lot of research on this. I think it's something like about 20 to one. Most spine surgeons I know that are good, they need a ratio about 20 to one. If they're 100 to one, they're not operating. If they're two to one, they're really dangerous. And even within spine, there's this spectrum. For example, if you're more like a 30 or 40 to one guy, maybe you're doing endoscopic discectomy. If you're more like a 10 to one, maybe you're doing spinal deformity, right? So this to me is a very, very important concept. And you have to know in yourself where you rest along the spectrum. So that's the win-loss matrix. And this is especially important for spine surgeons. Let me just give you an example. These are things that are said about spine surgery that are true. Highest malpractice, guaranteed low patient satisfaction scores. I looked across all my partners, we're mid threes, three, two, three, 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 five on a five, five point scale. All of my cranial colleagues, two A1 are 5.0. How's that possible? They seem to dominate the M&M conference, right? Every nurse, and I know my partners, they're all great guys, 3.5. If you see a five-star review for a neurosurgeon spine, like, like, a, like not one review, I mean like that's a cumulative review over 100 patients, I will tell you that was paid for. There's no way a spine surgeon has that, right? Now, you could game the system a lot of ways, right? Now, what about the other things they say about spine in neurosurgery, like can't operate, let them do spine. That's so common. It's a basic spine surgery. Let them do simple cases. We can always reoperate. All these things are being said about the spine at the same time. This makes spine the most difficult field in medicine. This left and right side of this picture shows why that is. It doesn't exist in any other field of medicine like this. Now, I'll take it at face value that everybody listening tonight and everybody out there wants to maximize wins and reduce losses. So the rest of my talk is going to deal with this. And these are the methods that I tallied up of how you could do that. Number one, increase the probability to win on any given try. Number two, reduce the probability to loss on any try. I know it sounds obvious, right? Number three, minimize the number of attempts, right? Minimize the iterations. Number four, minimize your sensitivity to loss. Number five, game the system. Number six, accept one's fate and build coping strategies, which is different from modifying sensitivity, by the way. So for each of these strategies, increasing probability of wins, reducing probabilities of loss, minimizing attempts, modifying sensitivity, gaming the system, and accepting and coping, I will talk about surgery and your love and life, love life and your life, right? 
So let's start with increasing probability of wins, right? So this is what we all try to do. We spend decades refining valuable skills, lifelong process of learning, CMEs, like a, like a border collie or like a katana or samurai sword being bolted a thousand times to have molecular level alignment uh, to get the sharpest sword there is. That's what we spend time doing, going to meetings, like the spine section, right? That's what we do. Uh, similarly, in life, right? You try to have a good good life in terms of your personal life, right? Tony Robbins will tell you how to do that. Some people uh, kind of get involved in materialism. Uh, people start to depend on things like drugs to help them feel better about the situation and, and, f and feel like they're winning all the time, right? And maybe that's one of the reasons why the opiate pandemic is so huge in America. So that's pretty obvious, right? But what about reducing the probability of a loss? So this is a great Confucian saying, which is by three methods, we may learn wisdom. First, by reflection, which is noblest, second by imitation, which is easiest, and third by experience, which is bitterest. And that's a great saying. And so here's an example of a patient that presented to me when I was in my second year of practice with an aneurysmal bone cyst, and I'd never seen one before. And I was uh, already sort of in charge at USC at the time. And so I was like, oh, I'm gonna, I gotta do this case, right? I'm the spine, new spine director at University of Southern California. So just before I was gonna do this case, I went to the spine section meeting and I spoke to all kinds of famous uh, surgeons out there, uh, many of whom are well known, uh, all neurosurgeons, um, and they told me, well, this is how I do it, and this is, you know, what I think I'd be worried about. So I returned home to Los Angeles uh, from Orlando, and I did the case, and, and this is why we get together. A lot of people say, I don't have time to get on that Zoom, or I don't have time to travel to Texas and see uh, Jack Ziegler do a disc replacement. We're just going to try it myself, right? Well, you try to reduce the probability you're going to kill somebody or hurt somebody. And, and, and you know, you think about how you do these surgeries, and they're not, they're not simple. And, you know, Seattle Science Foundation has provided a, a wonderful free resource where young surgeons can now go and learn about the horrible things that can happen in surgery and how to avoid those problems. So this is an example of how you can change the rubric on, on failure, right? Well, how about in your, your life? How about in your personal life? So this is a picture of my third child, my dear, uh, and I have three children, but my daughter is my dearest because the other two are boys. And uh, she's being born here in 04. This is her with my lovely wife as a baby. Here's her listening to actually Ed Benzel in New Orleans uh, giving a lecture. She's watching cartoons. And um, this is her with Chris Shaffrey getting advice uh, at the spine section on the bus ride home from Disney World. And so trying to reduce the loss by trying to educate your family, your kids, and, and get them ready for all the horrible things that they are going to face through an educational effort. That would be my strategy in that regard. Now, what about minimizing attempts? This is, this is actually a very common strategy, right? So my mentor, Marty Weiss, one of my mentors, I should say, at USC, who's the chair at USC, um, said there's only three types of surgeons who don't get complications. This is a great quote. I, I don't think he came up with it, but he used it all the time. People who don't operate, people are too stupid to recognize their own complication, and liars, right? And Marty Weiss always said this, and, and this, this is the first one. So you often hear people say, oh yeah, I don't get complications, right? And maybe they're lying, maybe they're too stupid, but oftentimes they're just not operating, right? So if you don't operate, you're not gonna get the kind of complications that the people on this panel get because we all operate, right, regularly. Now, what about in life? This is actually quite common as well for the um, art history majors out there. I'm not an art guy, but I really uh, love Edward Munch and everybody knows Scream, right? And Scream had many iterations. Started with this, it's called Sick Mood at Sunset. And uh, it was just in 1892 that he, he painted this. And the, the thing about Edward Munch was his mother died when he was, uh, I don't wanna say when he was born. And he was raised by his older sister, I think. And I apologize if I get this wrong, but she died when he was a teenager. So he lost so much in life in terms of love before he even became an adult. So he never got married. He never had kids of his own because he was so terrified to lose something because he had already lost so much when he was so young. And so this is important. Think about loneliness. You know, a lot of people kind of blow, blow this off. And I, I like to talk to my patients about loneliness, actually, especially in the coronavirus era. I talk about it a lot. Loneliness, if you look at as a all cause mortality, uh, risk. This is a forest plot showing how loneliness ranks up there with smoking in terms of mortality. So when you're lonely and you're alone and you're afraid to take the risk, there's a cost to that. Just like if you don't operate, there's a cost to that. There is a real, real price to be paid by not being willing to engage the world. How about modifying sensitivity loss? This is a really common one. In fact, I think we try to beat this into our trainees. My father, who's not a physician, used to say he thought that they made us work so hard as interns, meaning 
120 hours a week or so, just so that when we were facing tragedy that we would be too tired to, to really get depressed about it. I don't think he was right. I think they're just trying to get free labor. But I think there was a point to what he was saying, which was, yeah, you know, being able to uh, do this in war and not just cry about everything that happens. Think about what would happen to you, right? So here's here's an example of something we invented. I'm so glad Jens is on the call because I'm talking about Jens Chapman all the time. Jens Chapman, uh, I was turned on to by Chris Shaffrey because Jens Chapman published something called the Obdurator Outlet View for putting iliac screws in for open surgery. And we did, I believe, first in man, um, iliosacral screws, percutaneous, uh, and published on it extensively. There are other people published after us, first cases and whatnot. And, and um, you know, it was really cool stuff. And it came because I was talking to Chris Shaffrey and I read Jens's paper in the journal Spinal Disorders and Techniques. And so we just applied it to percutaneous screws using a floral image called the Updrader Outlet View. Now people call it the teardrop view. It's become so pedestrian now, but this is, we're talking about 14 years ago, right? Now, let me show you what happened with that. I, 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 I'll take credit for that. Maybe someone will come up and say, I did it before you might, well, guess what? You didn't publish it, right? But I didn't hear about it. So this is what happened when I sent that paper in. Right. This is the review. It was rejected. Right. Now, if your sensitivity to loss or harsh words or whatnot is too high, you're never going to write a paper. And you may have a lot of great ideas in your head, but it's never going to get out there because people are going to say, yeah, it's not going to work. That's no good. And maybe they're not even saying that. Maybe just that they, they just want to satisfy the editorial board in case they want to reject your paper. But this is a very good example of how you have to kind of toughen up a little bit and say, okay, no, I believe that this is something that we should publish, whether it's going to be used or not is different, but I'm going to publish this. So, you know, this is the kind of comments that I was getting, right? So what about in your personal life, right? Well, so has anybody here heard about Tinder, right? Uh, I don't, I don't think Rick's heard about Tinder. Have you heard about Tinder, Rick? You have. Okay. So even, 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 uh, if you will, senior spine surgeons, right? I can't call you senior wise, experienced, revered spine surgeons have heard of Tinder, right? So Tinder, of course, the idea is you can swipe left and you can swipe right and you can, uh, you can do that, right? Now, here's a guy who swipes right on 200,000 women with little success. I mean, you know, you figure swipe right enough time, someone's going to swipe back, right? And, and actually, the guy was brilliant, right? So he's, uh, he, he, he was just exhausted from this, but he became a lot smarter. He, they interviewed him. He said, oh, you know, now I'm not afraid of rejection anymore after 200,000 rejections, right? And there is something about that. You cannot be too afraid of rejection in life, right? And maybe that is the reason why there is addiction to video gaming, especially with young men nowadays, because when you lose, you just start over with another life. Or maybe why basketball and high scoring sports are so popular compared to maybe maybe soccer, right, in America. And I'm not a soccer fan, but I, I know why people like basketball. It's very exciting, constant scoring. You just start over again. You can come back at the end. A lot of things that can't happen in certain other sports, right? Now, what about gaming the system in surgery? Okay, so, you know, I would say gaming the system in, in an ethical way would be things like trying to use technology, like using disc arthroplasty to prevent adjacent disease, using MIS to reduce tissue damage, minimizing blood loss using techniques of using TXA or special hemostasis methods, improving targeting with, uh, with the Mazor like uh, Izzy Lieberman does with a robot or some better technology. I would say, you know, if, if you're gaming the system in surgery, game it with technology, right? Um, you can also game the system in love and life, right? So here's another example of Tinder. Here's a gentleman who, who, who tried to figure out this Tinder app. And unlike the guy who swiped 200,000 times, what he did is he just posted his picture upside down. And when you do that, then the, the woman has to, or whoever is, I shouldn't say woman, the other person has to look at the phone upside down. I mean, if you swipe left, it's really right. If you swipe right, it's really left, right? Pretty clever hack, right? Very simple hack, right? So you can, you can get sneaky about that and, and try to figure that out, right? But ultimately, I think wise people understand that you're going to operate, you need to accept your fate, and you need to cope uh, in doing surgery, right? Uh, we, we all do that by making tremendous efforts and sacrifice by trying to implement ethical care to the limits that we can with science, being honest with ourselves, understanding when we fail and, and admitting it at least to ourselves, and maybe most importantly, through camaraderie, through through talking with other surgeons who experience the same kind of thing as you. So, you know, I have a, I have a, I have a teenage daughter. You saw Sarah, she's now in her teens. And, you know, this concept of like a dream board or vision board. And this is, you know, you, you can look at like millions of these online or, or in your own home or school. And they're all really similar, right? They're all like this, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to travel the world. You know, I'm going to make a lot of money. I'm going to be, you know, taking a lot of good pictures on the beach. All these things, right? Perfect life, right? All that, right? Well, 
this is what a spine dream board looks more like, right? So you can, see, I'll just go through the complications from left to right, like a pseudo hernia, cage extrusion, thigh weakness from femoral nerve injury, screw loosening and haloing, hardware failure and access level mass plates, halo uh, vest causing epidural abscess, pulled out hooks, CSF leak with uh, pseudo membrane, uh, a thoracic uh, screw pushing on the aorta, pseudo membrane formation after laminectomy, wound infection, and and cage going into the end plate, right? So this is what spine looks like. This is our dream board. And, and anybody who says otherwise, I, I, I got in a very, very uh, cantankerous argument with a, with a honored guest surgeon from Europe who was telling me that he does deformity only and his complication rate is less than 1%. And I said, I, I, I'm gonna be honest with you, I think you're lying. He goes, nope. He goes, no, I'm not lying. I follow all my patients. I'm like, okay, well, I think you're lying. And he said, well, I don't let my residents operate on patients. I do the whole case myself. I'm like, I don't think it makes that much of a difference. 1%? He goes, yep, yeah, 1%. I'm like, okay, we can't have any more discussion about this, right? Because I can't trust any of the words coming out of your mouth anymore. If you can't admit that at the most basic level, either that or we all need to train under you. You're so good that I need to just give up my job now and come work for you, right? I don't think so. I think in all likelihood, Maybe he has a lower complication rate than me, but it's not 1%. So what does this mean? Well, now there's this whole, and, and I'm the youngest guy in this panel, except for, except for uh, Brenton. And uh, look, I mean, there's all this discussion now about like psychological counseling and surgeon well-being and all this stuff. And I, you know, I, I'm kind of stuck in the middle. I'm like, I don't know that that's the way to go with this. Um, but I will show you this very interesting slide. This is for neurosurgeons. And let me just make an addition here that I think that spinal orthopedic surgeons are a lot like neurosurgeons and spinal neurosurgeons are a lot like orthopedic surgeons. Right, so in other words, the hip and knee guys have less in common with the spine orthopedic guys, just like than, than I do with them, just like the cranial neurosurgeons have less in common with me than I do with Scott Blumenthal, right? So this is a very interesting paper published in Archives of Internal Medicine. It's a, uh, it's a two by two, basically X, Y axis. The uh, Y axis is satisfaction with what they call work-life balance, right? And the X axis is percentage of people burning out, right? So you can see that there's a regression line. The people who are less satisfied with work-life balance tend to burn out more. And you take that across all these different specialties and there's an outlier way down at the bottom. And I would say that would apply to neuro and orthopedic spine surgeons, which is we are not necessarily satisfied with our work-life balance, but it doesn't burn us out. Right? And that's a very important thing to understand. Navy SEALs don't really get paid more than the medic, but somehow they do a much more dangerous job and they keep going back in action. How do you explain that mindset? It is very different right, than being a nurse in a MASH camp right, versus being one of six men out in the middle of nowhere with no help. It is completely different. right? So that's part of what we do. And this is a quote by Henry March. He says, never marry a neurosurgeon. Their bad day is always worse than yours. But I think that accepting our, our fate and coping is recognizing that our time is limited, that we have to make the right choice in our partnerships, that we value and protect the ones we love and our patients, and we help them understand the demands of work in our life. And let me just say something I meant to say at the beginning. Uh, I've given almost a thousand lectures. The only lectures anybody sees are on Seattle Science TV for some reason. I, what I mean by that is my patients. And so I have to be very careful in saying, and I should have said at the beginning, this is a lecture for surgeons. It doesn't necessarily apply to people across the board. And people hearing what I'm saying may not understand why we're saying this because they've never lived it. They've never gone through what we've gone through, right? But it's because our job is difficult that we are special and we are special, absolutely special. This is uh, my true mentor, Mike Apuzo. He taught me the most about neurosurgery. He was the editor of neurosurgery. He founded the journal World Neurosurgery, which is the third biggest journal. Um, he taught me so much in residency at USC. And he would publish on the cover of the journal, which would be like the orthopedic, like the blue or white, we have red and white. So this was the cover for the meeting issue. So the meeting issue is the one that people read the most, right? Because it's distributed national meeting. And this is called Automat from the artist Edward Hopper. And uh, we were flying back uh, to LA on the plane after the CNS meeting. And he said, what do you think about the journal cover? I said, well, uh, and he, by the way, he, before that, all the journal covers were really boring, just like, you know, like just words and one color. He said, what do you think about the cover? I said, I don't, I don't really get it. Like there's this woman sitting there in this cafe. And he goes, yeah, see, you don't get it yet. You don't understand yet. And what he explained to me was that this depicted 
in his mind anyways, the loneliness of the journey that the human goes through, that nobody else can necessarily really feel it the way you feel it. Your spouse, you know, your loved ones, maybe another surgeon, maybe your best surgeon friend, you can have a conversation with what it's like to, to, to have a horrible complication. It's not easy to explain that to a wife or a child or your parents. It's just not part of their, 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 um, their, their life, right? So it's a lonely road, right? So when I talk about this concept of surgery and then you know, your, your, your outside surgery life, your love life, if you will, your family life, your personal life, I've described it to you in terms of a separation, right? In terms of a delineation of these two very separate and distinct parts of what you do and who you are. And I know many people who have tried to compartmentalize that, right? Often to their great peril that they think, well, I'm never gonna tell my wife about anything that happens, right? And then you have a horrible complication, you come home and you yell and snap at her. And she's like, why are you being so mean to me? And the answer is, is well, because you, know, you, you never discussed this before of what it's like to do what you do. And so these are just some pictures of me in my life. And those who know me well know that my personal and work life are completely blended. Uh, most people know about my wife uh, very well. This is us in Haiti. All these pictures of us doing things with our friends and my work and my personal life are, in, are congruent. They are overlapping and constantly part of the same iterative process of trying to improve the both of them together, not one without the other, but both of them together so that we can do the things we need to do and move forward so that, that she can understand what my life is like and I can understand what her life is like better, right? So, you know, we gather to commiserate. Uh, this is the hard part about Zoom. You can't have everybody talking on a Zoom, right? Um, celebrate and share and joys and failures. I cannot wait until we get back together in real meetings because I do feel like there's some advantages to this, but there's some major, major disadvantages. You can't really have that little conversation where I go to, you know, to, to, to Izzy and say, hey, Izzy, you know, I, I had this problem with the robotic case. What do you think? You can't really do that well in this venue. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you, this was very compelling. This was um, when Stephen Hawking died. This was a, an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. And uh, Tom Fuchs, who is a uh, man who won the Nobel Prize, is an MIT physicist, reflecting on his time with Stephen Hawking uh, in memoriam as, uh, as Stephen Hawking passed. And Stephen had organized this meeting. You know, he, he was afflicted with ALS at a young age, talking about the universe, right? And these meetings uh, happen largely in England, talking about things that I can never hope to appreciate or understand, stuff that is far too abstract, complex mathematically, right? And, and this is what um, he said. He said, it was a very unusual conference lasting over a week with a loose schedule of formal talks and lots of time for informal discussions. Cambridge, meaning Cambridge, England, was at its glorious best, lush, green, and fair, so we spent a lot of time outdoors. One day, my very young daughter crawled up and started playing with his shoelaces, meaning Stephen Hawking's shoelaces. He watched her succeed in untying them, and then he told her with a gleam in his eye, good work, and then turning to me, now about the universe. And this is what I mean about the community of surgeons. This is how I learned from Jens Chapman how to do percutaneous iliac screws and take that into the MIS realm. This is so important. This is why, for now, please tune into Seattle Science Foundation TV, because this is our best substitute for now. So in conclusion, I want to say... Know where you as a person, even if you're not a surgeon, where you are in this win-loss matrix, you have to understand that or you will not be having any chance to be happy. Um, adapt as best you can to maximize good outcomes as a surgeon. Recognize that this is a lonely journey. You may think you're the first person to walk down this road. You're not. But there also aren't many people like you. Find those with a common purpose and walk the road with those people. Walk with the good people. Otherwise, you'll dwell in a state of uh, of, of a very difficult limbo, and it often leads down paths that we don't really have time to go into, but they're not good. Um, I want to put in a shameless plug for the Neurosurgery Podcast. We're about to break 100,000 listens in the first year of launch, and it's really exciting. We've had a couple orthopedic surgeons on, but we've got to have this, this wonderful panel on as well. We had David Polly on, Mike McMillan, and some others, but mostly neurosurgeons, but we got to get more orthopedic surgeons on. So I do want to thank you for taking a time out tonight uh, to just to hear some thoughts and maybe a case discussion about myself. Um, and uh, feel free to email me any questions or concerns and looking forward to hearing from the panel. Mike, that was a great talk. And you know, one thing that you mentioned about you know, when you have a, a complication or loss in surgery, uh, 
as a surgeon, you feel worthless. And I think that what you said was really important, especially for the fellows and the young surgeons out there, is that you're not alone, but you need to talk to your fellow surgeons. Like I can remember many times talking to Jack and Scott and vice versa or to the other partners when you have a complication because you think that, oh God, I had this horrible complication. I'm not worthy. I'm not a good surgeon. I, I should quit now because I'm not any good. And everybody goes through it. But as you said, it, it's something that only another surgeon can understand. And you can tell your wife about it and she won't really understand and she'll feel bad for you, but only another surgeon understands it. So I, I think that's a great point. Yeah, you guys are very lucky that you have a great partnership. Um, so I guess the four of you are partners now, right? I mean, really, uh, you know, I'm envious. That's really like a, like, well, we actually have eight, 18 surgeons now. I mean, the four of you on this panel, right? Yes. Yes. Like yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like Scotty Pippen, Michael With Jordan. 20, 21, Rick. <laughs> I, I lose count. I think, you know, anybody that walks by TBI, we offer them our job, but. <laughs> <laughs> sure. There's gotta be other questions. No, that was a that Mike. That was a, a great, great talk. And, and like Rick said, we remember our bad cases a lot more than we remember our good ones. And it does help to have someone to talk to them about. And uh, I, I can remember two years back, I was having a, a tough revision case on an artificial disc. And it was when NASA was in Dallas and Matt Scott Young from Australia was here, who's done more ADRs and hybrids than all of us almost combined. And his response to me goes, Scott, spine surgery is blanking hard. And, and that's just kind of what we all, I mean, we all know it's hard. Like you're the link, you know, the older guys were very technically trained and, um, you know, sort of taught to be dispassionate and to kind of shrug your shoulders, let these things roll off as just the price of doing business. The younger generation, I think, is much more humanistic in their approach to the job. And you're, you're kind of right in the middle. You're the guy that's bridging uh, between those two generations, both literally and figuratively. So it's just an awesome talk and, and you know, putting in everything from high tech to uh, going back to human emotion. So I, I think everybody's kind of overwhelmed um, and very grateful to you. Thank you for doing this. I, I, think it, I think it's very interesting as a neurosurgeon that you can be on either extreme, right? We also know those folks um, who, for lack of a better word, there's a piece of them that's a little sociopathic. And, and I think sometimes that makes for a really amazing technical surgeon because they can just get better because the carnage doesn't stop them. But then you have to put that in check or that person is, I mean, we all know the cases, right? The obvious cases, everybody knows a person in town who's like that. Um, that's almost a harder matrix to get around, right? How, how do you even deal with that, right? I guess there's a podcast about that too. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't want to plug it too much. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Jens, I have a question for Jens. Jens is Jens has been through so much and done so much and seen so much, right? Um, do you think there's a real similarity between ortho and neurospine surgery, or do you think we're fundamentally like in some ways different because of our training or what attracts us? <clears throat> Thank you for asking me and uh, echo the sentiments in the chat room and of all the panelists, outstanding talk, thought provoking, insightful, humble and elevating at the same time. So kudos to you. Um, so I've been through highs and lows. The, the lowest uh, of my low times was during my adverse litigation uh, with a bone cement product. And it's a very lonely time. You really see um, who your true friends are and uh, uh, the sticking together, this community that you mentioned is incredibly important. Also having a strong sense of purpose and mission of uh, helping patients in the first and foremost place is uh, very powerful and that ultimately uh, convinced the jury in my case in my favor. I've lost my patient, but uh, the jury was very convinced and sided with me as we know. So, so that's kind of a personal message. To, to answer your question, finally, ortho versus neurosurgery, I really don't see a, a difference there anymore. There's a difference in training. Some have more spine exposure than others. Um, the, the classic thing of, oh, neurosurgeons don't care about losing a patient. That's no, not true anymore. We're in the same boat and uh, the, the, the middle ground uh, of spine has become so encompassing that the 
heritage of the uh, orthopod with a big hammer and the neurosurgeon uh, um, uh, with a, a CSF uh, pension. Th that's really gone, I think. Yeah, I, I, I wonder if one day we're going to have just the spine residency, right? Or, or like, uh, you know, like they're talking to neurosurgery about having like three years of general neurosurgery and then four years of whatever you're going to do. And maybe that spine, more like orthopedics, I guess. Um, I, I definitely feel like when I talk to orthopedic spine surgeons, they understand our issues a lot better than, than the cranial surgeons. I, I really feel that. And, and I'm not just saying that because most of you guys are orthopedic surgeons. I really feel that way. It's, it's hard sometimes to relate um, to what, you know, the cranial guys do. It's, it's just so different. Um, I think in fellowship, I, you know, we try to teach our fellows in neurosurgery that they've got to learn from the orthopedists. I actually have some pictures that one of the things I do, and, and you're probably gonna, gonna not like this, I have them go to Home Depot and get a hammer and a thousand nails. <laughs> I they can put them in a two by four because I wanna see what they can do. And you'd be amazed at the artwork that's, <laughs> that's, that's come out of that, if you will, because they didn't learn that. They really didn't learn that, you know? Mike, I think it's an interesting comment that, you know, at some point, if, if the academies, and I know neurosurgery is very strong and so is the orthopedic academy, that there should be really a spine residency. If you think about it, even a year of fellowship is not enough because spine has become so complex and we can do so much in so, so many areas. You can just be a, a cervical <laughs> trauma surgeon, you can be a deformity surgeon, um, tumor surgeon, whatever. And uh, it used to be way back when, when I was in training, there was one journal. Well, now there is so many, there's so much information out there. It's hard to keep up with it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But, one other comment that I really liked about your talk was you talked about the life balance and, you know, many of us, and maybe Jack said it, the, with the older generation, there's been a lot of folks that they, you know, dedicated their life to their career and to the demise of their families. And they've gone through one divorce and another divorce, another one. So they've been very successful in their professional life, but very much a failure in their personal life. And it's a fine balance. But I think that you, uh, you very nicely articulated that, at least to the young surgeons, to know that, hey, you sort of make a combination. You include each other in each other's life and to keep it going. So, um, and I think that's really important. It's a hard balance. I mean, I, I, I keep thinking about guys like Rick Fessler who sleep like three hours a night. And I know Larry Lenke had this story where he set his alarm clock a minute earlier every day till he couldn't take it anymore, right? And I'm not that kind of guy. I, I don't want to, like, why would I do that? And, and so the time is so limited. It really, really is. And so there's an interesting comment or question here about, do you think there, from Jerry Robin, do you think there are enough publications or chapters on bad outcomes for younger surgeons to learn from? And goes on to say, at AO Basic, they say education is learning from other mistakes, but experience is learning from your own. What do you guys think about that? I, th I think that's a great uh, a great comment. Um, and you know, tomorrow night I'll just put in a, a shameless plug. Tomorrow night uh, we're starting a new monthly series on arthroplasty cases, and everybody has to present uh, two cases. One is a, a terrific G whiz case, but the other one is a catastrophe or a disaster or complication, because I think that's, that is where you learn a lot. You know, we all like to pat ourselves on the, on the shoulder, but it's learning how to avoid uh, the next catastrophe. That is what makes you a, a better surgeon as you mature. So, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of truth in, in what was said, and we need to, to really concentrate a lot on other people's mistakes to avoid our own, but nothing sticks like your own. Yeah. I would say that a lot of folks on the panel, I know Jens and you, all you guys at, at the Texas Back Institute, you guys have have uh, have done a great job of publishing the negative outcomes too, and that's that's super important. I, I know that some of my mentors in neurosurgery, that's how they made their career, you know, because they were honest about publishing their their complications and their errors and what they learned, how hard it was to learn that. Um, yeah, it's, I think that's yeah. a great. You know, it's very hard for the fellows because, you know, while they may see the complications, as Jack said, unless you do it yourself, it really doesn't stick. You know, when I can remember when I was a fellow, you know, it's one thing like, oh, my God, the attending did that. It's not my fault. And, you know, you feel bad about it. But 
the attending, the person that did it really feels terrible. And I think that as a fellow, once you get out and you make a mistake, that will stick with you forever because you're going to do everything you can to learn from that mistake and never, ever repeat it. So an excellent <laughs> surgeon is one who has one complication and hopefully avoids it the next time. A fair surgeon is one who has a complication, doesn't really care, rolls off his back like, you know, duck off a, or water off a duck's back. And uh, so it, it's... You know, it's an interesting experience that we all go through in our learning. Can you guys comment on, on so, so I, I understand that when you're talking to fellows, it's all about patient safety and that's really important and you don't want people to go rogue. But if you're at the cutting edge, if you're, as, as, as all of you guys are, you're at the cutting edge, as he, as he was the first to use the robot, right? You're, you're attracting, not only if do, you, do you get more new interesting complications, but when they happen, people are like, they sling the arrows, right? Because maybe they don't like that this is different. Like, how do you, how do you deal with that? Maybe I'll jump in on that one, Mike. And I will, uh, I think we're sort of in a public forum here. So I'll, I'll reserve myself from taking the shirt off my back. Um, Cause yeah, that is what happens. But if you're committed to it, if you're religious about the patient care aspect, uh, you persevere, you, you take it on because you keep moving with the ideal. It's like any true leader of any big company or any army or, or any legitimate elected government official. Uh, if you have an idea, your responsibility is to mature that idea and keep driving it forward the best you possibly can. And that's what we do with new spine technology. And there's been a lot of great new spine technology that's come to the forefront the last couple of years. There's also been a lot of stuff that has been great, but never came to the forefront because people didn't keep it going. People didn't really drive it through and, and believe in the technology. So that's what you have to do. You just have to be persevering with it. And there have been a number of examples of that. And, you know, this replacement is, is, Another great example of there's still a lot of people that don't believe it, don't support it, uh, don't think it's going to work, uh, yet the results are there and the people that do believe it keep driving it forward appropriately. And that's what we need to do. But as you, as you mentioned before, uh, Mike, the, the answer to all this stuff is science. It's really, it's getting the data, tracking your patients. Um, you know, that, 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 that got me a lot of plane tickets uh, outside the U.S. because We've been able to track the patients with all the FDA studies, and you know whether it's good or bad, the numbers speak for themselves. And the guys outside the U.S. who don't have the same constraints don't get access to those kind of uh, outcomes. And um, you know they, we've been invited speakers, all of us, to lots of great meetings all over because they're thirsty for that kind of information. It's not just the eminent professor's results or you know, the single center's results. It's you know, multi-center, multiple surgeon, hundreds and thousands of pooled patients. Nobody's ever done that before. So e even though there've been some blemishes on, on arthroplasty over the last 20 years, the data's all out there, everybody understands it. And the denominators and the time frame is so big now that it, it, the numerator takes its rightful place as being relatively small. So that's how you respond to new technology is just to be a good scientist um, while being a good physician, educate your patients, let them make an informed consent whether they want to get involved in a, in a study. But if they do, they're contributing to the welfare of humankind as we go forward. And uh, it's been a good example for us in, in the last uh, half of our careers. And, 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 and as Jack said, I mean, the data, I mean, we would, we, we, the three of us would be out of business if the data didn't support all the arrows that we, we took in our back. And I'm, I don't mean to insult anybody's politics, but even to this day, when someone says, I don't believe in arthroplasty, my answer is, this isn't global warming. We've got data here. You know, you can, you can believe what you want, but the data is the data. And, and the other thing that I think helped drives technology forward, in addition to the science, it's also being willing to admit you know, the, the blemishes and publish the negative results that you may have had or the problems you've had. And that's what gains your credibility is to have intellectual honesty. Well, it looks like John Burleson has your next Seattle Science TV series lined up right here, which is, an, I don't know if you could do it anon anonymously, but maybe with a panel, your worst, uh, or I should say, uh, the horrible disasters, right, John? 
you want to you want to throw that out there since you got SSF SF SSF TV people here? Yeah, I mean, I, I just think, uh, and Mike Heisey mentioned the same thing. The biggest problem for someone like me or these guys that are coming out into practice is we have a real disincentive for the first time people are seeing me behind a podium to have me talking about some disaster that I tackled and either I did something wrong or just had a bad outcome. I kind of feel like it's a little easier for the people that have been doing it for 20 years and have a good reputation to say, hey, here's something I did wrong, and we all kind of take that the right way. But the younger guys – probably are making more mistakes at least I think they are um, so it'd be nice to have some type of form where they can submit the details and the images and then have one person present four or five cases and get opinions on it maybe that would disincentivize people from submitting you know these problems that they're running into it might make it easier for other first second third fourth year attendings to kind of figure out how to mitigate those same issues it's a no, great I, th idea. I think I think you're absolutely right so you know in the era of meetings which we may be over or maybe a year or two away, um, there's a couple CME meetings that every year, like the Cedars meeting and the Pittsburgh Spine Summit that have their faculty say, okay, you bring your worst disaster. And, and they do it for the residents and the fellows. And there's no reason that the Seattle Science Foundation, we couldn't have uh, a nighttime course saying, okay, you know, a few faculty, you bring, you know, here's do a deformity or an artificial disc or, you know, a degenerative fusion or MIS. Bring us something that didn't go right so that everybody else can learn from it. Right. We actually do that with our AO fellows course um, and uh, the old firesides have kind of permutated. So we try to get into this culture of being open and honest uh, about uh, complications and discussing those in a non-defensive fashion. So uh, that's that's a virtue that's, uh, that we've really tried to emulate with an AO and being, I find it like therapy. Michael was addressing that several times with the spine section, which is a great meeting, by the way. Um, I recommend it highly for my orthopedic colleagues who have not been there. Uh, but um, yeah, being honest about complications and having a forum where we feel safe to uh, um, uh, distribute our insights and gain other insights uh, is a quantum learning opportunity, no doubt. Uh, I was going to bring up some more methodological problems. So Michael brought up a great point, and that is when we have new technologies, how can we learn from those? And again, this is still a missed opportunity with manufacturers. When the disc arthroplasties came out, I was very proud to be one of the protest people, and I leaned very heavily on synthes at the time, but failed, obviously, to try to get a registry going. This would have been a uh, even beyond the monumental work done at TBI and with Mike Jansen and others, this would have been a really great opportunity to gain a maximum momentum and insights right away and cross over from the efficiency to the efficacy domain. So um, we see this with XLIFs now where, um, or, or other far lateral less invasive procedures where there's a larger number of uh, complex in complications that don't happen like to Michael Wong's, but others, and we see this here in the community uh, with um, ureteral tears and bizarre sympathetectomy uh, and, uh, results. And uh, we see it with robotics also, where uh, just the other day we saw a surgeon who used this enabling technique to misfire three out of four screws into the vertebral foramen, the patient miraculously surviving. Um, so th these are kind of opportunities where I think um, industry could be probably coerced a little bit more into creating a registry so that there's a better understanding of who does what and how things work. Um, and again, industry does not like that. They kind of just like to do this little wiggle and worm and then we follow, follow Scott's parabola, the famous uh, sinus curve of uh, flow up and flow down. Uh, so I don't know whether, whether you think that uh, going forward and based upon your uh, disc arthroplasty experience, this might be something that we could push industry more towards accepting as a new standard. Thanks. You guys are, I don't, I don't do those things. So what do you guys do about that? I think those are great comments, Jens. You, got, you guys do a post-market registry, right? In, in arthroplasty or? You know, well, we have, a, we said, have our own as registry. Say, yeah, as Yen said, it, it never really took off from the Synthes Depew thing to do it. it was kind of a misfire. But as Rick was saying, we've kept our own internal registry at TBI of over 3,000 arthroplasties over a 20-year period. 
which we're able to extract some interesting data out of. So we've just kind of done it ourselves. And, and fortunately with, with Donna, who's our research coordinator, you know, we, we, and, and electronic health records, we've been able to capture a ton of data. All right. Mike, you did such a good job. There's really no, you know, most of the chat room, as you're seeing, is just <laughs> complimentary <laughs> with the occasional uh, question. So I, I think you've, uh, you've uh, given us all a lot to think about and uh, just a really entertaining evening, Mike. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. having me. You guys enjoy. Yes. yes. You're terrific. Yeah, I, I uh, love blending the professional and the personal. That was really, really yeah. great. Yeah, Mike, great talk. Great talk for everybody. We all learned something. So we appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you guys. Take care. Have a good night, everybody. Thank Take you. care. Good night, everybody.